Good afternoon and welcome to The Angry Astronaut. Coming to you sans glasses again because, well, we need to talk about some serious issues today, most significant of which is the state of ULA and the fact that, frankly, time is kind of running out for them. This is something I don't like to do. As most of you know, I'm very fond of ULA, but I wouldn't be living up to my integrity as a journalist if I didn't report on what's happening with them right now, and it is pretty serious. But before we move on with that, I also need to mention to you guys that you are missing out on some of the best content that I've ever released. That is to say, a lot of you are missing out, and that is my recent tour of the Dynetics facilities. I'd like to make one thing very clear. They assigned an entire team of people, I can't believe it, the entire afternoon to show me around their facilities and show me all of the amazing technology that they're working on right now. It's not just about the all-new alpaca, although that lunar lander is looking even more impressive all the time. I learned new things about it, but in addition to that, I got a chance to check out a lunar dust shield, that is to say, something that's going to protect our astronauts from electrostatically charged dust that can be dangerous to our components and also can inhibit breathing if it's brought into the lunar lander. This shield made that dust disappear right in in front of my eyes. I couldn't believe it. Something you really need to check out. Also, I got a chance to check out a very important component of SLS, a huge component. But a lot of you didn't even know that Dynetics works on SLS, but they do, and they even let me crawl inside it. It was mind-blowing. And also, I got a chance to simulate a landing on the moon at Shackleton Crater using a lunar simulator, the same that astronauts get to use. I, honestly, I didn't expect any of this when I went to visit them. It's unique content. Content, by the way, that no other YouTuber has ever covered. Everyday Astronaut hasn't done it. What About It hasn't done it. All these channels that are certainly much bigger and better than mine, and yet none, none of them have covered this particular topic. So instead of checking out my Starship coverage, which I'm not nearly as good as other channels on that topic. That's being very well covered by my colleagues. I would say that you should definitely check out the Dynetics tour. Okay, so all, by the way, all of that's going to be linked in the description and at the end of this video. Let's get on to ULA. And in case you're confused, that young lady in the UK has a payload on the Astrobotic Peregrine, which is scheduled to be launched by ULA on Vulcan Centaur on May 5th, although that date is almost certain to slip at this point because ULA has instructed Astrobotic to not ship Peregrine yet, and given the fact that we are less than a month away from May 5th, it seems very, very unlikely that ULA is actually going to launch on that date. So what is going on? It's not the BE-4 engines anymore. Blue Origin, after lots and lots of delays, has finally delivered on their promise. Nor is it the new solid rocket boosters being provided by Northrop Grumman. However, it may have something to do with the RL-10 engines provided by Aerojet Rocketdyne, although I find that to be extremely unlikely as well. The RL-10 has been in service for about half a century now and has done a fantastic job this entire time. RL-10s are incredibly solid engines, and I strongly doubt that they had anything to do with the anomaly that took place in Huntsville, Alabama. Once again, to be completely clear, this anomaly did not affect the Centaur 5 upper stage that's currently in Cape Canaveral. However, given the fact that the anomaly did produce a very substantial explosion at the Johnson Test Facility, that alone was probably enough to give ULA pause and make them very concerned about their first launch of this rocket, which, like the first 
first launch of the Japanese H-3 and also like the first launch of the Virgin Orbit Launcher 1 from European soil simply cannot afford to go wrong. Why is this the case? Well, first of all, the whole reason that Astrobotic decided to go with ULA is because of their perfect flight record with the Atlas V and the expectation that the same kind of flight record could be expected with Vulcan Centaur, which frankly is little more than a modified Atlas V with BE-4 engines and an advanced upper stage. All of the scientific payloads on this incredibly valuable spacecraft could be lost, but it goes a lot further than that. ULA has a vast number of pending commitments with a variety of extremely high-paying customers that they have no rockets to launch. Atlas V is now 100% committed to launching a variety of payloads, most significant of which is Project Kuiper. There's a total of nine Atlas V launches that are now committed to launching the Project Kuiper constellation before Vulcan Centaur takes over. In addition to that, there are six Boeing Starliner launches, in addition to the first crude test of Boeing Starliner that ULA is committed to as well with Atlas V. There is no room whatsoever to use Atlas V for launches in the future if Vulcan Centaur continues to be delayed. Sierra Space, for example, has a backup plan to use Atlas V to launch their Dream Chaser spacecraft, but there are no Atlas Vs available. Moreover, it is now currently against the law to use Atlas Vs for military payloads. Now, some exceptions might be made to this rule. However, Congress passed a law years ago to forbid any American military payloads to ride on rockets that use Russian engines, which is exactly what Atlas V uses. So Atlas V is not going to be a stopgap rocket for military payloads much longer. Vulcan Centaur is scheduled scheduled to carry the first U.S. Space Force payload for this rocket in about six months. And if it isn't able to do it, that's going to put their entire military contract with the U.S. Space Force, many, many billions of dollars in serious jeopardy. This didn't even look like a remote possibility at the end of last year. Vulcan Centaur looked like it was on the very cusp of being ready to launch. And uh, by the way, it also needs to launch at least two times before a military payload can ride on it. Why is this? Well, according to U.S. military doctrine, a rocket actually needs to have three successful missions before they will schedule any sort of military payload to ride on it. The only reason that ULA is being allowed to go with only two launches ahead of time is because they turned over all of their design blueprints to the U.S. Space Force. The military is apparently satisfied with what they've seen thus far Far, but nevertheless, the Vulcan Centaur is a long ways away from being certified to carry military payloads. In the meantime, Falcon Heavy has been certified to carry military payloads for a considerable amount of time, and SpaceX only has 40% of the U.S. Space Force's contracted launches for the next five years, which means 60% of the U.S. military's future launches are now in jeopardy because of the situation with Vulcan Centaur. So when Tori Bruno says that Vulcan Centaur will launch when it's ready, well, it's not quite as simple as that, because if Vulcan Centaur isn't ready until sometime next year, their contract with the U.S. Space Force may very well get torn up, which is going to put ULA in a very serious state of affairs. And not only that, if Amazon and Kuiper starts to become concerned about the future of Vulcan Centaur, that puts billions and billions of dollars worth of business with Amazon in jeopardy as well. And not only that, I think the most important thing we need to consider is the fact that the U.S. space program has only one launch provider that they can count on right now. SpaceX has a virtual monopoly on almost everything the government is doing, from NASA to the military to just about anything else. All medium to heavy launch payloads have to fly with SpaceX, which is a very grim state of affairs. You never want one 
launch provider with a stranglehold on the purse strings. That is never a good thing for the U.S. taxpayer, and it's not a good thing for the U.S. space program. But until ULA can get Vulcan Centaur into service, which hopefully is going to be very soon, that's the reality that we're going to have to face. But it gets even worse than that, because even if Vulcan Centaur is ready to fly sometime in May or maybe in June, if there's an anomaly on that first flight, it's going to put the future of LA into serious jeopardy indeed. They can't afford to lose Peregrine. They can't afford that first of two all-important launches before carrying a military payload to go south. Yes, ULA has had a fantastic record with Atlas V, or indeed the entire Atlas series. They haven't had a failure in 20 years with that rocket. But in many respects, Vulcan Centaur is a whole new ball game. All new engines on the first stage, new manufacturing process, and materials, and even though Centaur 5 uses very reliable RL-10 engines, there's lots of other things about that upper stage that make it very different from the Centaur of old. It's an advanced upper stage that apparently on its first launch is going to be able to dump off a couple of Kuiper satellites in low Earth orbit and then subsequently deliver the Peregrine lander all the way to the moon. That's a tall order for a single launch and something only that an advanced upper stage like Centaur 5 is going to be capable of carrying out. This is a complicated first launch and it can't afford to go wrong. However, if there's a company that can make this happen without a single hiccup on their first launch, it's ULA. And when Tori Bruno says Vulcan will launch when it's ready, well, that's because he's well aware of the fact that this first launch cannot go wrong. They can't afford an anomaly with either of Vulcan's two certifying launches before they start carrying military payloads. And the only way to make certain of that is to make sure that everything, test articles and all in Hunts as well as all of the components in Cape Canaveral are performing perfectly prior to that all-important launch date coming up. I'll tell you, I'm going to be chewing my fingernails off, and I can only imagine how ULA engineers, technicians, staff, everybody at that company, and especially Tori Bruno, are going to be stressing out when that day comes. Smash that like, hit that subscribe. Also, please check the description for various ways to keep my content going coming. I'm leaving for Colorado Springs in just a few days to cover the Space Symposium and of course the Starship Orbital launch as well. And also please don't forget the Dynetics tour that's going to be linked at the end of this video. And as always guys, stay angry about space!